<clears throat> All right, friends, well, we will go ahead and get started. Hope you all can uh, see me okay. Let me get this here. All right. Welcome, for joining us tonight for your patience. If you have folks, if you as we all are uh, learning how to <laughs> use Zoom to use the internet for absolutely everything. Um, as the, as you read for what you've read for, we're doing a webinar tonight called How to Have Difficult. My name is Mallory Wyckoff. I am the executor of Faith of you who are nearly familiar with FCC and the work that we do, let me just say that Faith uh, Center is to build inclusive communities by helping people get to know their neighbors. Okay, I'm sorry guys, I don't know what happened there, but I'm gonna try to get this back going here. I hope that you can uh, can hear me. Uh, Bethy, will you send me a message to make sure I'm back on now? Okay, thanks, sorry guys. I, I don't know why it's been working fine all day. So here we go. Were we just talking about grace for technology? Uh, so, as I was saying, that's our work with the Faith and Culture Center, the work we do here in, in Nashville and beyond. And so I wanted to say that just by way of introduction, but also to sort of set up why this webinar, why we felt like this content is important enough to spend some time on it to help uh, engage in conversations around it and educate folks uh, about it. And here's the reason. In everything that we do, we want to bring people around shared tables that they can share meals and conversations about things that matter. Um, for several years, for even before that, but especially in the last few years, I've heard so many people frequently say, man, I just wish we could get people together who don't agree on things to actually be able to talk about them instead of just listening to various talking heads, you know, spout out different opinions and theories and ideas and, and posit these different positions. What if we could actually get people together, maybe around a shared table to talk and to engage with one another. And I hear that desire from so many people. And so that's one of the things that we try to provide and make it, make it, make it accessible for folks through FCC. And my sense is that so many people, while they have the desire to do that, they don't necessarily have the skill sets to be able to do that. Um, and part of it is just, we don't have very good modeling for it. We have so few good examples of people doing that well and doing it in a civil way, a respectful way, a fruitful way. Um, a, ray, a way that's really conscious and present and aware. And so I'm really hopeful that this year that some of the work that we can do with FCC is not just make space for those conversations, but really equip people to actually have them because that's gonna be essential if we're able to move forward in any full and, and productive way. So for um, both this, this webinar tonight and then also our continued conversations through it. Okay, so one of the most important things that we'll talk about uh, is uh, gonna be illustrated hopefully by this, this image. We all know this is an iceberg. When we think about engaging in difficult conversations, what we tend to do is to focus on the things that are above the surface, okay? As we know that, we as always like the phrase, right? Tip of the iceberg, that the bulk of this massive thing is actually below the surface where you, it's not visible. Um, it takes a little bit more exploration to see. But what we tend to do in these conversations is focus on everything that is above, uh, above the, the surface. And these are uh, facts and evidence and ultimately the positions that we come to, the positions that we hold, the positions that we posit and articulate to, to others. So we think about engaging in difficult conversations. A lot of times what we do is sort of picture ourselves even on the top of, of this iceberg, if you will, and sort of just amassing ourselves with as many facts and, and as much evidence um, that we can to then ultimately support our position so that we can uh, defend it or articulate it and communicate it well enough to others. Meanwhile, there's another iceberg just down the road of folks who are in the opposite camp of whatever the position or issue is who are seeking to do the same. And either we tend to not even engage at all, or maybe we just try to, to uh, you know, lob different uh, facts and, and thoughts and ideas at one another. And ultimately, that's not going to get us uh, too far along the road where we're wanting to go. And so what I want us to think about is this concept of going below the line. 
uh, part of my uh, graduate um, education was in conflict management. And gosh, if I heard one phrase more than any, it was this one, go below, below the line. Because folks who are trained in alternative dispute resolution realized that if you stay above the line and you, people are just trading in thoughts and position, they are never going to get anywhere and it's going to remain adversarial for very long, particularly if they came in as, as uh, adversaries and uh, with really opposing positions, opposing arguments and, and sides. And so what they emphasized over and over was this idea of going below the line because below the line is where people's needs and ultimately their interests lie. And I don't just mean I mean, the things that, like, that they're interested in, I mean, uh, the things that matter to them, their values, how this impacts them. So we're shifting from the what above the surface to the why, again, going below the line. And the reason I highlight this is because I think that this is essential for us to go below the line, both for others and for ourselves. And what I mean is, when we are engaging in any sort of really fruitful uh, dialogue and conversation, um, we need to be going below the line internally to say, okay, what's going on within myself in this moment? What are my needs? What are my feelings? What are my convictions and interests that are informing what's above the line? Um, and so, so often we just spend time above there and don't even spend time personally sort of um, introspectively looking within. And so that's going to be essential. We'll talk about some of that tonight. And we need to be going below the line with our conversation partner, our partners, to be thinking about what are their needs, what are their interests, what are their values as well, what is the why that's underneath this particular position, whether I agree with the position or not, whether we ultimately come to the same conclusion, can I look below the surface, can I go below the line and get a much broader, deeper sense of what's informing it, the why. Um, so I want you to think about that concept throughout our, our time together as we, as we talk. And ultimately, if we're going to have that focus about going below the line, then we're quickly going to realize that this is not about changing people's minds. And I want to say that I do think that if we are able to engage in really healthy, robust dialogue with people, then ultimately minds are changed. Now, I'll say that I don't think that ought to be our primary goal. And I'll also say that that requires that I'm open for my mind to be, to be changed, for myself to see things differently. So at minimum, it can't be the goal that I'm gonna come in as this um, resolute figure that's immovable and I'm just and seeking to change everyone else's mind. Um, I wanna be open to minds changing, including my own. And even so, I wanna say that that's ultimately not gonna be our, our goal in this, but rather, there's a lot more at play. And I think this quote from um, Israeli uh, philosopher Martin Buber really highlights it well. He says, in spite of all similarities, every living situation has, like a newborn child, a new face that has never been before and never will come again. It demands of you a reaction that cannot be prepared beforehand. It demands nothing of you what is past. It demands presence, responsibility, it demands you. Uh, I love this quote. I think it's, it's incredibly uh, illustrative of what we're, we're trying to talk about tonight, which is this is not just sitting on top of our icebergs and seeking to amass as many facts and as much evidence as we can to try to support our position and send that over to the other group until we clobber them to death with it and they ultimately, you know, to come and say, you're right, right? Uh, but there, there's a whole lot more going on here. And that I do think that we can prepare ourselves for these conversations. We'll talk about that. I do think the preparation is a lot more internal um, and a lot deeper than just uh, seeking to prepare our, our minds and brains with, with thoughts and ideas and facts. So that, that can be helpful. Um, but ultimately, this requires presence, that I would be present both to myself and to the individuals with whom I am communicating. It's also going to require consciousness, which we're going to talk about um, here in a couple minutes, but that I would be ultimately and fully present here and now. If I'm coming into this moment, um, just seeking to remember all the things that I, I thought, oh, when I have this conversation with this person, if I say this and then I say that, and then I'm gonna trip them up when I, when I point this, you know, this issue out or whatever it may be, um, we're not able to really be present with the actual individual in front of us with the conversation because it's always new, it's always unique and it requires our full presence and attentiveness, to, again, to ourselves and also to the individual across from us who, 
if we go back a slide here, think about again, all of their needs and interests and values, the why um, that's underneath their, their positions, their ideas, their, their beliefs. I find uh, this to be incredibly helpful and significant when we're thinking about how our own ideas and opinions are formed and then also those of others. Um, this is called the Ladder of Inference. And it came out uh, several decades ago from some folks out of Harvard Business School. So let me just sort of describe it here and then we'll, we'll talk about its import for tonight. So going all the way down to the bottom of that ladder, we start with observable data and experiences. So it says as a videotape recorder might capture, right? The data that exists around us, the things that we see and observe. So we have those and that's the pool that we draw from. We select data then from what we observe. So there's this entire pool of data and we select some of it. Then going up another level, we begin to add meanings, cultural and personal, we begin to make meaning of what those data are signifying. Then we begin to make a assumptions based on those meanings that we just added to those data that we've, we've selected. We draw the conclusions from our assumptions and we adopt beliefs about the world, about ourselves, about others, about all things. And then ultimately that leads to the actions that we, um, that we make based on our beliefs. Now, the most interesting thing to me about this is this reflexive loop that you can see identified here, because rather than this being our thinking process that we then return back to step one and go to that bottom level of observable data and experiences. Instead, what this indicates is that actually we just go back to the, the data that we've already pre-selected. When we first had this wide open pool of data to us and we selected some of it and then went through this ladder of inference, we actually return right back to our pre-selected um, data and we don't return all the way back to uh, the bottom. Now we do, uh, almost all of this unconsciously and this loop actually happens in less than a second in our brains without our awareness. And so what I want to suggest is that we have to begin to bring our thoughts, our feelings, our body awareness into our conscious awareness so that instead of these things just happening automatically and reflexively that we're just going through this, this loop sort of mechan mechanistically and totally unconsciously, that when there are data, instead of us just grabbing from that pre-existing pool, that we might actually be open to, to all that exists. And I'm going to say that this is true, not just for uh, facts and evidence and figures about things external to us, so that is true and really important, but also to, the, to data that exists uh, to observe about our own selves, who we are, um, what's going on on internally within us when we are having a conversation, what, what is being triggered within us when we have a conversation, how our body is, is doing, what it's telling us. We'll talk about those things a little bit, a little bit more as we go on. But ultimately, the idea is that we want to shift into a place of living um, more conscious, more aware. I'll read this uh, quote from Deepak Chopra. He says, the point isn't to change your actions, but to change your consciousness. To do that, you must walk a path from A to B, where A is a life based on the incessant demands of the ego, and B is selfless awareness. One of the reasons that we give into these incessant demands of the, the ego is, is because uh, we keep drawing from that same uh, pool of data that we've, we've pre-selected. And certainly if that pool and on the meanings that we've derived from it and, and the um, beliefs and actions and so forth, if those are praised by, by people around us, then that's gonna continue to confirm and build up our ego. If we don't wanna be the one who is different from, right? We don't be the one who looks foolish or stupid or other than, and so we, it, we just continue to engender that same um, the same patterns and same ways of thinking, um, which our, our ego really, really likes. And this is true for anybody, right? Everybody is in many ways slave to the ego until you begin to become aware of it and it's controlling you. And so this, this idea of consciousness is that we would walk the path away from the, the incessant demands of that ego and into selfless awareness. It would become more aware of who we are and what's going on within us and thus what's going on in the world around us. An example I like to use to sort of illustrate this idea of consciousness is this. So about a year ago, my husband and I moved from another house in East Nashville to where we live now. And 
as we were getting ready, getting the house ready for our renters, our tenants that were going to be moving in, um, I was upstairs and there's a room in the very back that kind of overlooked our backyard. And I was up there and I was looking down in our backyard and I thought, these renters are going to think that we're crazy because when we had first moved into that house and we were trying to figure out what to do with the backyard and sort of do just some basic um, landscaping, we have two really big dogs and they had sort of trotted out this little path in the middle of the yard that uh, was not a straight line. It wasn't even like a nice curve line and it didn't, it wasn't anything sensible. It, it sort of went in 18 different directions all the way from the, the uh, back porch to the, the, alley in the back and it followed no rhyme or reason it was just the one that the dogs had sort of um, staked their claim in the yard to say this is our this is our path this is how we navigate the backyard and so when it came time for us to um, want to put down some pavers that we ourselves could also walk uh, through the yard we decided well they've already laid out this path let's just put the pavers over this and that's the path that we'll walk when you were standing on the path when you were down on it um, at the ground level you didn't notice it as much but once I got up on that second story and I was able to look down over that backyard and see the way that this, this path ran, it was crazy. It made no sense. It was all just no landscaper would say, this is a really um, sensible or even um, nice to look at path, right? It was just, just, we strictly did it because it was the one that was there. And then once we put those pavers on, it just became the path that we used in our backyard. Consciousness is a lot like getting this elevated view over something and particularly over ourselves to be able to see it in a new way. So when I think about this idea of consciousness, I think about even in a given moment and in training ourselves to be able to do this over time, we'll talk a little bit about how to do that in a few minutes, but even in a given moment, that it's almost as if I pause on something and I begin to almost look down over myself, if you will, and go, what's going on for me right now? Why, why am I feeling that way? What is it that that person, when that person did this, I started to feel this way. I noticed this in my body. What's that about for me? I just noticed that I said that, or I did this thing. Why is that a pattern for me? Why is it whenever I feel afraid, this is how I respond really reflect, reflexively and automatically. And I begin to notice and increase my awareness around the things that I'm doing and the patterns that I engage in. Um, and I spend some time sitting with that and, and uh, holding it in, in deep reflection and offering empathy to myself, as we'll talk about, and seeking to live with awareness and so that my, choice, my choices are conscious choices, that I've sort of looked at all the options and I've said, this ultimately is, is the healthiest choice for me, for those around me, and for all of the world, rather than this is a choice that I'm just making automatically and reflexively default just because it's the one that's there. And that's the one that the pavers were put over, right? It's the one that, that here it is. And so this is the path that I walk down, but rather it's getting some elevation to be able to almost look down over ourselves and say, you know, this is a path I've been walking. This is the one that has felt maybe most fitting to me, or there's reasons why, you know, this is the path that I chose. This is, these are my common um, actions. These are my common behaviors or feelings or sort of go-to impulses, but I have all these other options available to me. And if I can live consciously with deeper awareness, uh, then I might begin to practice and engage some of those options and I'll do it because I'm making really conscious, uh, healthy choices for me and, and for others. To me, that's how I think about this idea of consciousness. That's going to be essential to us if we're ever to engage in really, really good, um, robust, rich, meaningful conversations with others that we could do so with a lot of consciousness, both during the, the encounter and we can train ourselves to do that more quickly, but then also after. And I'll offer um, an exercise at the end of our time for how to begin uh, developing that, that awareness, both in the, the post-reflection and then also in the, in the moment. Okay, so one of the ways that we uh, begin to think about um, entering a conversation consciously is to think about one of the, some of the things that we are bringing into a conversation. And so I want to do this, uh, this exercise with you. And um, I'm going to bring up on the screen in just a minute, some names of different group, groups of people. And I, what I want you to do is to just notice how you respond, especially notice your body. Um, is there any, anything that you notice? within yourself when uh, when you hear 
many, many different groups of people. Something in your shoulders, you feel any, any, you know, tension and tightening? Does it affect your breath at all? Um, do you feel a headache? And just any sort of physical sensation, even slight. Do you feel any emotional response? Um, do you feel triggered in some particular way? I just want you just to notice how you respond as you read and then hear me say these different groups of people. Let me say, this is not the time to pretend uh, that you love everybody and are kind to everybody and feel the same about everybody. Maybe you are the one person who does. If so, congratulations, you lead the webinar next time. I wanna go on recorded record and say that that is not me, right? Like anybody else, I have my own biases, my own um, assumptions that I come into a conversation with, and I'm wanting to become more aware of how I'm bringing those things into a conversation and how it's informing the way I'm able to engage. And um, so this exercise is designed to help us do that. So again, just pay attention to what comes up within you, both, both how you feel physically, emotionally, but then also, are there any thoughts that come to mind that you, that you notice? And notice them without judgment. Just observe without, without judgment or critique. Just notice what comes up, okay? Democrats, Republicans, Socialists, Millennials, baby boomers, white people, men, wealthy people, poor people, immigrants, politicians, West Coasters, Southerners, and my favorite, Floridians. Take a moment and just notice how you responded. Pick one or two of these that you felt like you responded to um, most intensely. And just notice, are there any particular thoughts that you tend to associate with, with those groups? Just notice that for a second. Again, without judgment, without critique, just notice it. Okay, so beginning to think about some of the associations that we make with these uh, various groups. Maybe some of you um, are having some thoughts along the lines of um, they don't care about the environment or they are out of touch with reality. They're lazy. They're demanding. They're immoral. They don't know enough. They're entitled, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe there were one or two of these that you responded most, uh, most strongly to, even if it was a it was slight, but you began to notice, okay, there's something that came up for me that didn't for the, for the others. Uh, maybe there were some favorable responses as well to some of these you have a really positive association with. But I just want us to increase our awareness about um, sort of even our bodily reactions and responses to these particular, uh, particular groups as they're, as they're read, because depending on which of these groups with which we identify, right, there's always going to be other groups that we don't identify with. And if we're coming into a conversation with folks um, with whom we disagree and, and who identify with the other party or the other tradition or the other religion or whatever it is, if we're coming into a conversation with those immediate thoughts of they just don't get it, they don't care about the environment, they don't care about life, uh, all they want to do is um, uh, spend money. They don't want to spend money. You know, whatever whatever the thought is, that's all ultimately going to really cloud our ability to be able to engage with the human being in front of us. As Martin Buber reminded us a few slides ago, that this particular conversation with this individual in front of me requires that I would be present to him or her. And that, that requires that I'm not paying attention to those um, assumptions and thoughts that are going through my mind about who this person is and what they must be about. Out, but I'm getting to attend to them and what they're bringing to this particular conversation. One of the other reasons it's really important for us to be mindful of what comes up for us when we make these associations is because they tend to really quickly lead to dehumanizing language. This can happen really quickly um, and statistically it's, it's linked to increased violence. The, the greater um, levels of dehumanizing language, the greater levels of violence that are associated with it. And I think one of the most apt examples of this comes from uh, the Civil War in Rwanda at the end of the, the 20th century, 
where people didn't start killing each other overnight. But over time, and particularly through the increased use of dehumanized, dehumanizing language that the um, uh, majority group of the Hutus would, were sort of setting the stage for this violence over time. And then ultimately, really, it was like the straw that broke the camel's back was when you had particular people and politicians who were, especially on radio stations, just saying, kill the cockroaches. You could, and then they did. Um, they did then begin to kill one another. And of course, you had so many lives lost uh, because of it. But it's one thing if you say, kill the people, kill your neighbors, right? That has a different response to it than kill the cockroaches. That says they're less than human. Who wouldn't want to kill a cockroach? They don't deserve to be alive. They're, they're gross. They bring disease. They're pests, et cetera, et cetera. And we begin to make all those associations related with this language. Our language shapes reality. Our language uh, dictates reality for us. It shapes it. And so it's essential that we be thinking about our language, not just the language that we're using to people, um, but the language that's going on within our minds about them and noticing how are other people using, uh, using their language to describe these various groups and, and other groups. And do I want to be supporting, um, do I want to give, give any sort of um, ear to people who are using dehumanizing language, whether in, in subtle or, or really um, aggravated ways? Do I, want to, do I want to pay attention to those people? Are they the ones that, that, uh, whose opinion I want to, I want to hear and, and um, give time to? Again, look for its frequent and insidious use in everyday conversation and, and vernacular. I think about this a lot. I have uh, two daughters and my oldest daughter, all of this three and a half. And oh, probably six months or so ago, she watched um, a movie with some of her older cousins. And I noticed immediately after that she started to say, oh, there's the bad guy. And I thought, you know, we've never used that language before and are really careful not to, but she had heard them, them use it because, you know, it's not uncommon, especially in kids' movies, to point out, well, this is the good guy, this is the good, um, the good woman, this is a bad guy, the bad woman, the bad people, whatever it is. And so we've been spending a lot of time to really try to um, help her see that ultimately when she, she even asks, is that the bad guy? And we say, well, nobody's bad or good. Everybody has the power to make good and bad choices. Because ultimately what that does is uh, one, just confuse her sometimes. Uh, two, it makes for really long conversations. Things aren't as easy and simple. But what it also does is it, is it um, keeps me from being able to assume that all this exists ex external to me, right? The bad people or the bad things, the bad ideas, those are separate from me. And I, into a way in which I could identify them and name, those are the bad ones. And certainly I'm different from that. Instead, if I can acknowledge everybody has the power to make bad or good choices, well, then I'm now responsible. I'm now, um, I'm not let off the hook in the way that I could be if my language said they're the bad ones. Certainly, I'm not in that, in that camp. I just use that example to say this is a really common way that we even hear this sort of really dehumanizing language pop up. Um, in, in movies, TV shows, books, just casual conversations. So just begin to pay attention to that. Notice it when it's external to you. Also notice it when it's happening internally as well. Uh, so this is a little bit what we've already been talking about, that, but that when I come into a conversation, again, making those sort of moralistic judgments, I'm immediately drawing that distance again between uh, myself and the person that I'm talking to or the groups that I'm talking to. And so what I want us to do is think about this idea of shifting from coming into the conversation as a judge, whether or not that's how we think about ourselves coming into a conversation, often that's a position that we're, we're taking making because we're always making those sort of judgments but could we shift from coming into this conversation from the position of, of judge that says I know the right way to believe about this thing or to act in these ways and I need to convince these other people of this and again all that then they get to remain external from me to instead coming into a conversation from a, a posture of being a learner of having hands open to pay attention to and be aware of everything here that I'm able to learn from, whether it's about myself or about the other person or about the world. But at the end of every conversation, I could come away saying, I've learned something. My curiosity has been piqued. I wanna know more about, I wanna have a conversation about, I wanna do some research about. If, if uh, because what, to me in, in my mind, those open up further conversation and further connection with myself and with others. If I come in as a judge, it just closes it down because all I'm trying to do is get others to the point where they agree with me and then that's really the, uh, the end of it. 
Um, but instead, I want us to be able to learn to communicate authentically and vulnerably and intimately with others, um, which requires that we would uh, look reflectively and honestly with them. A beautiful example of this, um, I heard from one of our Seat at the Table participants uh, about two months or so ago. She is a, um, a, a high schooler and she's a first generation American. Her family is from Nigeria and she attends a particular uh, high school here in Nashville. And she is uh, in the, the minority at her high school as this young black woman. And she said that she was at, um, she went to some friend's house and they, were ha they had some family over at that, um, at that house. And she already had some assumptions in her mind about how this, this might go um, based on this particular group of people that she was gonna be in the home of and how they were and what they were like. And so she was beginning to think, I bet they're this way. You know, I bet they, maybe they vote this way. They think this way. This is what faith looks like for them. You know, to begin to have those, some of those thoughts. Um, and then she tried to kind of set those aside, but then when she, she came into, um, into the, the house and saw her friends, actually all of the assumptions she had were 100% accurate. She was right on all these, all these things that she assumed about these people and how she might experience being, being with them as this young, young black woman. And instead of stopping there and just saying, oh, yep, I've pulled from that same, you know, the, the same, um, think about that, the ladder of inference from earlier, right? I pulled from that same set of, of data that just reconfirms the things I've already believed about this particular group. What she said to herself was this, okay, do better, Esther, do better. She was telling herself, don't just stay here in this place and just, and just allow myself to believe that these assumptions or these stereotypes I had about this group of people are true. There's always more to the story. And so what she did, even as the minority woman in this, um, this group of people, she made it her mission to ask a lot of questions of them so that she, at the end of the time, she could know there's more to them than just this thing, right? There's more to them than just their race, their religion, their socioeconomic status. Those things might be true about them. It's not to say that they, they cease to be. It's just to say that that's only a small part of who they are and of their story. And what she committed to each time was to say, okay, do better, Esther. Don't allow yourself to stay right here and assume that you know everything there is to know about them based on these associations. Ask better questions. Seek to be a learner. Be curious about who they are etc. Uh, to me, that was a moment where I had a 17 or 18 year old woman really uh, school me in a lot of things that I want to continue to learn and to, to model well. Okay, so let's talk about some strategies for shifting from adversarial conversation to empathic engagement. Sometimes when we're having difficult conversations, um, the, the adversarial component might be really obvious, right? We don't like each other or we openly disagree or, you know, it's, it's a little bit more clear. Probably more often than not, it's not quite as obvious, but we feel it internally that like, this is that person who keeps posting these sorts of things on Facebook, or this is that person who keeps saying this at the dinner table or whatever it may be. And maybe there's not this open sense of, of conflict uh, between the two, but it's, it's more um, under the surface and we certainly, we feel it. And so how can we shift from that sort of conversation to empathic engagement? I'm going to talk about these, um, these few steps, and then we're going to illustrate them, each of them as we, as we move forward. So first, pay attention to your body. Second, listen for your feelings and needs and listen for those of others. Three, exercise empathy. And that is true both for you and for others. We'll talk about that more. Finally, reflect your values in what and how you communicate. So I wanna give you an example of, uh, of this and then we're gonna break each of those down and talk about them a little bit more, but let me, let me give you an, an example. Um, and, you know, as a parent, which I am, you get to uh, choose the examples you share. So I could choose plenty of examples where I don't get it right. But for the sake of this illustration, I'm going to choose one where I felt like, I think I got that right. I think I did what um, the moment asked of me to be a, a good parent. So again, I was sitting with my oldest daughter all, all of the other day. And after nap time, I went in and she said, oh, will you read this book to me? And I said, sure. And then she got a kind of a funny look on her face and said, um, there might be a page that's ripped from it. And immediately I'm thinking about how over the last two months we've been having these conversations with her about how uh, it's not okay to rip the pages from your books. 
And there was a time a few weeks ago, even where I came in and she had pulled one out of her book and we had this long talk about why it's not okay. And she said, okay, I won't do it anymore, mom. And then I lifted up her pillow and she had not only pulled out one page of her book, but every single page from the entire book and they were all under her pillow. And in that moment I just lost and was, was laughing because I was, I couldn't believe that she had done it to every single page and not just one. So anyways, we've had multiple conversations about this and here we are in this moment and she tells me, uh, there might be a page ripped out of this book, the one she wants me to read to her. And I said, did you rip a page out of your book? And immediately I watched her face. She kind of stunned and she put her hands over her face and she covered it. And really quickly, I realized she's having a shame response. And I began to walk through these different steps uh, in my mind for thinking about here's how I need to communicate with my daughter in this moment. Certainly there's a part of me that's thinking, are you kidding me? We've been over this a hundred times. Why would you tear these pages out of your book? You know that like, this is ridiculous. And we've, we've talked about this and, and I could go there. I could go to the immediate sort of uh, punishing and we've talked about this and here's the consequence and all of that. But in this moment, particularly because her shame response was so evident, watching her cover her face, I thought, Ooh, I know that feeling. I remember that feeling as a kid when you felt really embarrassed and a sense of shame. I know that feeling now as an adult. I know what that feeling is, whether I'm literally covering my face or I want to, right? Even in the middle of a crowded room, I just want to cover my face because I feel the sense of shame. And so what I did in that moment was just pay attention to my body. Okay, how am I feeling? What's, what's going on in me? I felt some of that frustration. I felt some of the tension. Um, I also felt some of this really strong emotional connection uh, with, with all of I was trying to think about and uh, pay attention to her needs, to her feelings in that moment. Also listening to my own feelings and needs in that moment, all of, all of them. Uh, and then I sought to exercise empathy um, because she certainly needed it in that moment. She was having the strong shame response. And again, I'm thinking about not only can I imagine what she's feeling, but I've experienced really similar feelings. I, I know what that's like. And so that what I wanted to do is then to reflect my values, reflect the things that I think are important for our family, for her as an individual, not just in what I said, but then how I said it. The conversation took a lot longer than it would have if it, I would, would have just gone with more of an adversarial response and a punitive response. Um, and maybe sometimes those, those things are necessary, but at least in this conversation, because I happened to maybe have gotten enough sleep the night before that I was able to be really present to her in that moment, present to this particular conversation and what this particular engagement required, I was able to kind of follow some of these steps and we had a really, really beautiful uh, connection in that moment. So let's talk about each of these as we sort of um, break them down one by one. So first, as we're shifting to the sort of empathic engagement, one, pay attention to your body. Um, our thoughts, our emotions can lie to us in a lot of different ways, but our bodies tend to be really good truth tellers. They tend to tell us a lot of things that we don't want to pay attention to and that maybe we've been able to sort of push aside in our minds and in our, in our feelings um, to sort of quiet our feelings, but our bodies just don't do as good of a job as of hiding those things. And I'm really grateful for that. And so this is why I like to start with paying attention to our bodies because um, most of us don't live in our bodies. We live separate from them in our, in our heads, right? We tend to really functionally live as if we are brains on sticks. And so everything's kind of going on up here and we need to begin to shift more fully into our bodies uh, because we're bringing our bodies into conversations, right? We're not just bringing our brains to meet, have an engagement with another brain. We are a whole bodied person engaging with another whole bodied person. And so it's important to pay attention to what our body is communicating to us in that moment. I feel uncomfortable. I feel nervous. I feel afraid. I feel excited. You know, I feel um, some anticipation or, oh, when they said this, I noticed that I felt this pit in my stomach. We're just beginning to pay attention to it. And every time I'm gonna suggest that we observe ourselves and pay attention to it, I'm always wanting um, to qualify that with saying, observe it without judgment, without critique. That's the only way that we can have empath engagement, engagement not just with others, but with ourselves. Um, and to get to that point of deeper consciousness, if we stay in the place of, oh, I noticed that my body's doing this and I'm, I can't believe it's doing that and I'm mad at that, we're never going to get to the type of consciousness that's required to have the, the conversations that we're wanting to have. So 
Listen to your body, pay attention to it. Then listen for your feelings and needs. Um, we'll talk about listening for others' feelings and needs in a second, but it's essential to acknowledge that well, we have to own that we are responsible for our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. So what others say and do may be a stimulus, but it cannot be the cause. We have all said things like, oh, you made me so mad, or you make me feel guilty, or like the classic sibling line, right? Like my sister made me do it, my brother made me do it, and we can see it more clearly in kids, but the reality is that even as adults, our language really betrays how we actually feel about things and that we tend to believe that our feelings and our thoughts are um, the other's responsibility and that they hold all of the, the power in that, that they get to make us feel or make us be behave or respond in particular ways. The reality is they don't. We own those things. They are ours and we get to choose them. This is not at all meant to shame us, to say, well, there, you know, there we go again. There's another thing I'm not doing right or taking responsibility for. Rather, it's meant to free us to say, the other person in this, in this conversation, they don't own the keys to my feelings. I get to choose how I feel. I get to choose how I, how I speak. I get to choose how I respond. I get to choose how long I stay here or not. They don't control this. These are things that I get to control. There are plenty of things in the conversation I don't get to control and that's okay. But if these things are within my control, then I ought to pay attention to them and to own that responsibility. Again, realizing that what others do can be the stimulus, but not, not the cause. So I need to listen to myself. What are my feelings? What are my needs? Again, I'm going below the line. Remember the iceberg image. I'm going below the line to figure out what's going on internally with me. What are my needs? What are my feelings? What are my interests here in this, in this moment? And then also listening for the feelings and, uh, and the needs of, of others. Others are far more likely to hear you and engage deeply when they feel like you actually hear them. So it's important that we're not just listening for what other people are saying, but again, we're going below the line and what's under the surface for them. So as an example, they might articulate their particular position on, let's say, immigration or healthcare or the economy or some, some sort of policy or whatever it, whatever it may be. They're offering you a position. They might be offering you something that's above the line. They're telling you, this is my position. Maybe here's some of the facts or evidence that seem to support that particular position. And, and here's, here's the what of the conversation. Um, and it can be really helpful as you are listening to people talk above the line that you are going below the line to say, so what's underneath that for them? Not that we can be mind readers, but that we're trying to be really present and pay attention to what, you know, what they're saying and what's, um, what's under that. So an example might be as if, you know, someone says something about, again, their, their thoughts on, let's say, immigration or an economic policy, you could say, it sounds to me like you're feeling fear about the direction of our country and that you really value stability for your family. Okay, so let me pause. They're talking about position and you shift to feelings. You shift to needs, right? They're feeling fear. They have a need or a value for security and stability for their family which ultimately, if we can get to this point, it will lead us to an empathic engagement. We'll talk about that in the next step. Uh, but that's what we're, we're listening for. What are the needs and the, the feelings and emotions that are underneath the surface of their particular position? And we're beginning to, to listen for those things and then ultimately to ask, you know, am I hearing you correctly? And they might say, no, that's not quite it. Here, here it is. Or yeah, exactly. And then they are likely to continue on and to share more about their position. The reality is that most people really struggle to identify their own needs and feelings, um, but they're really great maybe at talking about positions, and they're certainly great at talking about or perceiving um, the wrongness of other people's positions, right? I can tell you why, um, why I believe this thing or that I believe this thing and why it's, I'm right and they're wrong. We have plenty of models for that. Um, turn on any cable news, news station, whatever, whatever station it is, you can find that modeled all day long. What we don't have a lot of modeling for um, in, in, in really any ways is of people being able to identify the, their needs and um, what's, what's driving underneath their particular positions. Um, and so when we actually are able to listen in this way for other people, we're modeling it really well and we're inviting them to do the same. We're inviting them to do that for themselves so that when they, maybe they have a particular um, position and they feel really passionate about it and man they're getting ready to get on social media and just 
type up that response about why everybody else is wrong and they're right and couldn't everybody just see this way? What if they've previously had an engagement with you where what you kept doing was listening, not just for their position, but rather the needs underneath it? Why does that matter for them? What's the value there? What's the thing that they, that they, they value, they hold um, dear, hold to be true, the things that they need, basic human needs that everybody shares, basic feelings that everybody shares, right? This feeling of fear. I know what fear is like, right? Whether I share the person's position or not, I can understand and relate to that feeling of fear. And that's going to get me to a much deeper place if I can go there than just we're, we're talking back and forth about the, about the position. So try listening for those things, even reframing back. It, it sounds like this is, you know, what, I, what I'm hearing you hearing from you. Is that it? You know, and then inviting them to, to respond. Third step in moving from adversarial uh, conversation to empathic engagement is exercising empathy. So uh, uh, one beautiful example of this was this uh, gentleman here on the left, and uh, he is a, an attorney, a human rights attorney, and he's running for uh, Congress in the state of Virginia. He's a Muslim man and a, a proudly Muslim man. And uh, the, the gentleman in the brown shirt is, um, uh, strongly has has strongly uh, come out against this particular candidate and the party that he is a representative of, and in some really really hurtful and um, uh, vengeful language, even really uh, sometimes seemingly violent language, hostile, and would call him out and just lob all sorts of insults and um, racist sentiments, Islamophobic sentiments, etc. And so what this gentleman did, the, the gentleman with the red scarf um, who was running for Congress, is he looked, he looked up the, the man's profile. And he saw that in his profile that he had a link to a GoFundMe campaign. So he began to do some research and to see that this man's wife had really severe medical issues. And he had a GoFundMe campaign set up to help pay her medical bills under which they were really struggling, under the weight of which they were really struggling. So what this man did is instead of the candidate, what he did is instead of just beginning to go on the defense or attack or say, here's why you're wrong about Islam or about me or whatever it may be, um, what he did was he donated money to um, the GoFundMe campaign. And then he asked all of his followers to do the same. And in a really short time, they were able to meet and then far exceed the um, fundraising threshold for this, this GoFundMe campaign. And then very quickly, the, the gentleman in the brown shirt uh, contacted the guy and said, will you meet with me? I want to talk. And they're able to have a really beautiful conversation. He said, come, I want you to put a sign um, in my front yard. Uh, he's even willing to vote for him. And ultimately, the gentleman said, you know, my, a lot of my positions in terms of policies or politics hadn't, haven't changed all that much. But I see this man very differently. I even see the part party that he rep represents very differently. And at minimum, he is no longer engaging in the hateful language about Islam or uh, things like that. This required that, um, that the, the congressional candidate exercise empathy in this moment, right? He could only get to this point if instead of just looking at the particular positions or even actions of this man, but that he could see you know, he's probably really hurting right now. He's probably really scared. He's afraid of his wife's uh, deteriorating health. He's afraid of what's going to um, happen if they can't pay these medical bills. Um, he's feeling sad about losing this companionship with his wife because she's no longer as, you know, physically active and, and healthy, et cetera, et cetera. He can to empathize with this man. And in doing so, as, as I put the note here, he's not offering any sort of approval or affirmation of just that man's position or even his actions, right? It doesn't say that it was okay that he was spewing this sort of um, uh, uh, vitriolic rhetoric online and, and um, at this man, but it is simply to make a human connection, right? Just acknowledging that the basic needs that this man has were also the same needs that, uh, that he himself had. I think it's a really beautiful example of exercising empathy. A question we might ask or wonder about is, is empathy always possible? Um, and so I found this, this example, which I think is quite profound. This came from a woman named Eddie Hillison. She ultimately died in the Auschwitz concentration camp. But here's one thing that she said in one of her journals that was, that was uh, recovered there. She said, I'm not easily frightened, not because I am brave, but because I know that I am dealing with human beings and that I must try as hard as I can to understand everything that anyone ever does. And that is the real import of this morning. Not that a disgruntled young Gestapo officer yelled at me, 
but that I felt no indignation, rather a real compassion, and would have liked to ask, did you have a very unhappy childhood? Has your girlfriend let you down? Yes, he looked harassed and driven, sullen and weak. I should have liked to start treating him there and then, for I know that pitiful young men like that are dangerous as soon as they are let loose on humankind. It's hard for me to imagine a more, um, a, a more difficult scenario in which uh, someone could possibly drum up some sense of empathy for another person, right? That even in the midst of a concentration camp, that this woman somehow is able to tap into this connection between her and the man who was part of ultimately uh, murdering her, right? But that she could see he's a human being. There's something in him that connects with something in me. There are things I can see in him that I connect with and understand and can relate to. I, maybe I had an unhappy childhood or I, I know what it's like to have a, a friend or girlfriend or boyfriend let me down. I know those, those feelings. Uh, I just, I, I continue to be struck by the profundity of this particular example of, of empathy. Um, and so I want to suggest that if we practice it more with folks with whom it more easily comes over time, it becomes more natural and um, more easy to be able to practice it with those for whom previously it had been fairly difficult. I'm not sure I could ever get to this point, but gosh, I hope that I work towards that end. Okay, so the last step here in moving towards empathic engagement, reflect your values in what and how you communicate. I am not interested when I hear people um, share their positions, even if I agree with their positions, even if technically the um, concepts that they're saying align with the ways that I tend to think about the world and what would make sense politically or socially or, what, or economically or whatever it may be. Even if I'm on their team, I'm not interested in hearing what they have to say if the way that they're talking about how they're communicating it um, actually betrays the values that they that they say they have. You cannot say that you uh, care about human rights when the ways that you are engaging a human in front of you to talk about this human rights is actually dehumanizing, right? Um, so I think this is a helpful exercise. Imagine for a moment that you were able to talk to everyone around you and convince them to think and believe the exact same as you, right? Okay, you finally did it. Everyone thinks the same way, right? You, you wrote the, the Facebook post that finally just, just put the nail in the coffin and everyone says, oh, we're with you. Like, we, we got it. Thanks. Okay, just imagine that happened. Now, imagine that they became ambassadors for your position or cause or philosophy. And the way that they champion that is modeled by how they saw you do it. Would that ultimately reflect the kind of world that you want to see? Maybe you met the goal of getting this person to change their mind and now they're on your team. Great. But the way, what if they were to then communicate with others and engage with others in the way that they saw you do that? Would ultimately, beyond just the positions, beyond just the party lines or religious lines or whatever it is, beyond those things, would that be the type of world that you want to see? Would that be saying yes to the version of the world that you want to see um, coming to fruition? Probably sometimes yes and sometimes no. I find that to be a helpful exercise to try to keep my... Um, my values uh, reflected in what and how I'm, I'm saying. I love this, uh, this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that he says, the means are the ends in the process of becoming, right? Contra the notion that the ends justify the means, rather the means are the ends. The means are ultimately the outcome and result in the process of becoming. And so regardless of what the end is, regardless of what the result is, how I seek to get there, what I demonstrate, the values that I reflect or don't reflect in there is going to be part of that end, end package. That to me is a much um, bigger and more important question in conversation than just, does this person agree with me or not? Because there are plenty of people with whom I disagree politically, socially, whatever it may be, um, but whose values I see represented in ways that I think, yes, that's the version of the world that I want to see and I want to see come into fruition. So when we are communicating, when we get to the point of when we're speaking and sharing or even how we're just posturing ourselves, making sure that our values reflect not just in what we say and we're not just telling them, well, here's my value, here's my position, but that what we really value is we're embodying it. We're offering that again in a, in a fully embodied way and we're, we're reflecting it to others. Okay, so I want to do a, a practice here with, with this. Um, I'm reading this as an example. It comes from a, a book called Nonviolent Communication. You can see that. Um, I find this to be a really helpful resource by um, uh, Marshall uh, Rosenberg, a psychologist, and who started 
something called nonviolent communication, which you can read, uh, read more about. But I'm just gonna, gonna read an example here from this book. And as I do, as I read these different snippets, I want you to kind of go through the steps of one, paying attention to your body and listening for needs, emotions, um, uh, interests, both internally and then for the person who, who I'm gonna be sort of role playing here. Um, we're gonna move, move through, through these, these steps. So uh, the scene is that there's a young woman who works at a food bank and she's volunteering with an older woman who's there who happens to be looking at a newspaper. And all of a sudden, the older woman says, uh, what we need to do in this country is bring back the stigma of illegitimacy. Okay, notice what you feel when you hear me, hear me say that, right? Maybe you fall a little caught off guard, sort of like the woman, the other woman in this, this exercise does. And so you have a lot of different ways you could go with this, right? You could be, excuse me, what are you talking about, right? But here they are, they're two women who volunteer at a food bank. And so this, uh, the young woman is trying to think, okay, we have a lot of values here that we say that we espouse. So how can those values inform and reflect this, the way this conversation goes? And so she uh, says, are you reading something about teenage pregnancies in the paper, right? Like, tell me why this, you even said this thing, this thing right now. And the woman goes on to say, oh, it's unbelievable how many of them are doing that. And don't you feel alarmed because um, little kids want, you know, stable families and, and on and on and on. And uh, then she says, um, my father would have killed me if I would have done something like that. And we knew what would have happened to us if we got pregnant and, we were, you know, if we were Girls were scared like we were. There wouldn't be so many illegitimate pregnancies and, and so forth. Okay, if you were sitting across from somebody and you heard them you know, just spouting these things off, how might you feel? How might you be responding? What facts are, are automatically coming to your mind or these things that's like, oh, I wanna spit this out. I wanna say this to her. I wanna share this story or, or prompt or whatever it, whatever it may be, okay? Notice those. Then also consider what would it look like to ask questions of this woman to try to get a sense of what are the needs here? What are the values here? What are her feelings in this? Again, not just the, the position, but going below the line to say what's, what's really going on under the, the surface for this woman. In this example, um, the, the student is able to do that because she had been practicing this, this notion of nonviolent communication. And so what she does is, is she asks those questions and she realized that this woman has a son who has been trying, he and his wife have been trying to get pregnant for several years and have um, not been able to do so. So she asks more questions around that. This woman's desire to become a grandmother, her desire to see her son and his wife have this family that they've really been longing to see. And she begins to get a sense of maybe some of the things that are informing sort of the sharpness with which this woman has a position of, we need to, to bring back the stigma of illegitimacy for uh, young women who have um, uh, un, um, uh, pregnancies out of marriage. And because again, there's these two women who are volunteering at a food bank, if the, the younger woman listening to this older woman's position would have just come out with facts and figures, or even, even ones that maybe you agree with, right? What if she would have said, well, we care about the, about the dignity of all human beings and we care about these, these young women and, and their babies and on and on maybe factually you would say, okay, I agree with those positions. Um, but if what you're saying is we care about the dignity of all human beings and you're doing that with your finger pointed at this woman's face, right? And with a whole lot of anger and a whole lot of rage and the sense of superiority that I have it right and she's just missing the ball, then my values are not reflected in what I'm saying, right? I may be communicating them with my words, but in my body, in my actions, in my tone, in my spirit, um, I, I'm not, I'm reflecting something entirely different. I'm saying that actually dignity belongs to some people, but really not to you. You're not, you're not deserving of that in, in this moment. Um, so I find this to be a, a helpful example because it's sort of even triggering for me when I hear that woman say that it's like, oh, oh goodness. Right. So okay, how, how would I respond? What might be some of the things I would say? And it was really in this example, this, this woman in the book that the younger woman that she was able to begin asking questions and ultimately, she moved to a position where at the end, she was able to name some of the things that mattered to her. She was able to, to say her position a little bit more clearly. But the way that she did it was informed by all the work she had been doing to get to understand, um, to listen to the feelings, to the needs of this woman, to engage empathically and to understand. I can imagine 
what it might be like to be a grandmother really longing for grandkids and seeing um, maybe some families who weren't trying to have kids and could, or some young, young teenagers even who are getting pregnant and here is her son and, and his wife and they're unable to. I can imagine the difficulty. I can imagine the pain that she might be feeling and how that might be informing her position, whether I agree with her position or not, right? Okay, so uh, let's talk for a few minutes about when it is time to speak. We've sent a lot of talked a lot of times about prepping ourselves, looking internally, asking questions of the person. So a few things to say um, when it's time to speak. Remember, we've actually already communicated a lot to our conversation partner by how we've engaged with them. So if we come in and we just assume I've just got to get all my points and thoughts and positions across, um, then we're going to be saying a lot. We actually need, don't need to use as many words as we think we do. Realize that we're still communicating even without articulating our positions, but by our body posture, our tone, the fact that we're asking them questions, inviting them into further speech, giving them space to name what matters to them. We're um, demonstrating curiosity, wanting to know more about them and, and their, their thoughts and feelings and, and positions and, and so forth. We've already been communicating a lot, so keep that in mind. Uh, then it can be really helpful to find shared values, to name them, and then to, to draw from them. So a great example of this comes from a group called Rethink Media. And what they did was they sort of put together 10 different uh, statements that they then focused groups throughout the US. That what their question was of these 10 different statements, which of these are the most likely to get to you um, to improve your view of um, Muslims and Islam? These are people who had a, uh, who indicated a sort of a bent towards being Islamophobic or concerned about Muslims or an unfavorable view of Muslims. And so they said, okay, here are 10 statements. Which of these do you respond most favorably to? And there were ones about you know, trying to show um, the successes of Muslims or actually to correct uh, stereotypes about uh, violence in Islam and all these sorts of things. But the, actually the statement that um, rated number one across all of the groups to say this is the one that matters the most to us and that actually has the most impact on us had to do with um, religious freedom. And that in the United States, this is a country built on religious freedom and we don't tell people how to pray or how to worship and we don't ban people um, based on their uh, religious preference or identity. And a lot of people responded to that and say, yeah, that is a value that we have. And then that began to inform the way that they would, they would think about people who um, prayed differently than them or thought differently than them or, or looked differently. So again, finding this, this, these common values can be really important. And then really just inviting people to live up to those values that they, that they espouse as we're also seeking to do the same um, for ourselves. It can be really helpful to share personally and vulnerably and to be really specific. Um, stories can be really helpful. Uh, they, uh, research indicates that if you can help talk about your sort of anecdotal connection with something that, um, again, to use the example of Islamophobia to say, you know, my friend Sarah, who I've, I've been having meals with um, in the last few, few months, uh, she's Muslim. And here's what I've learned in, in watching her observe or, or practice her, her faith right? It begins to bring the, the larger ideas and concepts and um, uh, positions down to earth and down to this really individual one-on-one um, -on -one level that can be really helpful. And certainly story has a tremendous ability to, to change us and to change uh, others as well. And then lastly, this is a, something that one of my professors in um, facilitation and, and mediation in that, that program I told you about earlier, she would say this, and I just thought, man, it's really helpful. She'd say, speak as though you're right and listen as though you may be wrong. I thought, yeah, that's a really great balance and something I want to try to reflect is speak boldly, right? If there's something you believe, this is a conviction you have, name it. You don't have to shy away from it. You deserve to, um, to, to say what it is that you think and feel and why and to articulate that position boldly and passionately. And to listen as though you may be wrong, to listen acknowledging, I don't know everything. There may be some things I'm missing. There may be an invitation for, for me here to rethink something and to see, see things with eyes open more widely to something, to learn something new about the, the human across from me, to learn something new about myself or about the world. And so if I can listen as though I may be wrong with that ear open to be um, a, a learner and to have curiosity, then there's a whole lot more room there for rich engagement um, if I compare that then also with the speaking as though, um, as though I'm right. 
Some of you may be familiar with this. I thought it, these might be helpful to name in relation to uh, engaging in difficult conversations. These come from Christopher Stendhal. He was a, a former bishop in the Lutheran Church and um, city of Stockholm, and also a professor at um, Harvard Divinity School and one of their former deans. And he came up with these three rules of religious understanding that I think um, are easily applicable to what we're talking about. So. He says, whenever you're engaging with people who um, believe differently from you, whether we're talking about religious differences or political, whatever they may be, these are just sort of his rules for engagement. One, when trying to understand another religion, position, whatever, you should ask the adherents of that religion and not its enemies. That seems fair, right? Basic human fairness. If I say that I value honesty and I value not maybe not bearing false witness against somebody, then it would be, I would not really be reflective of my values if the people that I'm allowing to shape the narrative around this group are the ones who already are its enemies or who um, see, see the world very differently or who are antagonistic towards this group. It's very different if I can start with the adherence of that position. So again, I'm not interested in how somebody on the opposing side articulates the other group, the other camp, whatever. There may be some value in there, but firstly, can I go to the person who holds that position, who stands in that camp and say, tell me what this is like for you. Tell me what you think and feel about this. Uh, tell me your experience with, with this. And I hear from the, the adherents of that. Second, simple. Don't compare your best to their worst. That is so incredibly common and it's uh, really easy to do, but it can be profound to say, I'm not going to compare the best of my group with the worst of theirs. Um, because again, what, one of the things that that does is it just keeps us in that sort of reflexive loop that we talked about where I just keep going back to the data that I've already pre-selected, keep making the same meanings and assumptions and behavior and, and thoughts and beliefs to say, yep, yeah, I've seen this before. Yep, yeah, I've seen this before. This is the worst of their group. Every group has uh, some folks who reflect the values well and some folks who don't, whether it's my group or the other group, right? So don't compare your best to their worst. And then lastly, he uses this line that's so beautiful. He says, leave room for holy envy. It's this notion of uh, being open to see something in this other person in the, the um, religious group with which they identify, with the, the political group with which they identify, with the um, nationality, you know, that they it's part of their identity. Um, leave room for holy envy in that, but even say, even if this is not my particular tribe or position, I love that this group values this. I love the way that they care about this. I love the way that this is important to them and the way they, they seem to uh, demonstrate their, their commitment here. Uh, I think that's a real, again, it leaves that, that notion open for this curiosity and for openness and learning. Also important to, to note, these are just uh, points of departure for engagement, right? They're not ends in, in and of themselves, nor do they get us to the point to, to pretending that everybody's saying the same thing or everybody agrees on everything or believes the same way. We don't, right? But if we can start from this place, if these can be our points of, of departure, then they can help us to resist that kind of dehumanization that occurs when we tend to uh, very quickly make those associations about groups with which we, we don't identify. So I find those to be really compelling, whether we're talking about engaging with people of different faiths or just anybody uh, in general who is, is different from us or thinks or, or believes differently. Okay, so we talked earlier about this, this idea of needing to become more conscious and aware of how we're engaging and how we're acting and how we're, we're behaving. And I find this to be a really helpful acronym for that. So some of the things we need to do is begin to observe how we are in conversations, again, without judgment, without critique, just notice, just observing. Uh, to begin doing some self-inquiry and reflection, asking questions around it. And then move into self-development to say, okay, I'm noticing these patterns. I need to pay attention to something to there. Do I need to begin exercising um, myself in a different way, engaging in a different way, behaving in a different way? And do I need to begin practicing those things? And so with the acronym of SNAP, I find it to be really helpful to say, okay, in a moment, whatever I'm doing, I'm talking to somebody, I'm engaging with them, that I could SNAP and just first stop, right? Just pause. I'm, it might be in a way that's visible to the other person, but it doesn't even have to be, but I'm just going to pause for a second, stop and notice, just observe. Again, it's sort of like looking at yourself, looking, um, being above yourself and sort of looking down and just noticing, what am I doing? Uh, just notice it without judgment. What am I saying? What, what's that thing I just said? What's the way that you know, how my body is right now, how I'm, I'm engaging 
in this person or what's the thing I'm thinking about doing or saying, just noticing it. Then asking why. Why did I just say that thing? Was it because I made a conscious choice that that was the right thing to say? It was reflective of my values and it demonstrated respect of this other person? Or did I do it because I was so mad and I wanted to prove them wrong? Or I was upset that I didn't feel like they were listening well to me and I was going to get them to listen to me? Or on and on and on, right? Asking, okay, why did I do that thing? Oh, I, okay, I'm, I'm posturing my body in this way because I'm feeling anxious. Um, so I'm either maybe I'm shrinking back or I'm seeking to become bigger than, than the other person, right? Emotionally, I'm going to take up more space so I don't feel as, as vulnerable or beat down in this conversation. Why, why am I doing that? Ah, okay, I'm asking. I, I, feel, I feel vulnerable or I feel uh, my ego is, is bruised in this moment, right? What, whatever it may be, just asking questions around it. And then lastly, P for pivot. Okay, do I need, is this the right thing to do? Is this this thing that I'm doing or saying or how I'm responding? Is this the healthiest, the best way to be engaging um, with, this, with this other individual or this group? Or do I need to pivot in a different direction? Do I need to change the way that I am? Do I need to bring my tone down a little bit? You know, I'm starting, oh, I noticed, I stopped and noticed I was raising my voice. I'm asking why, because I'm feeling, I'm feeling passionate right now. Um, but I'm noticing that that's uh, turning some people off and making them feel afraid. So, okay, I'm going to pivot. I'm just going to return to a calmer place, right? And then, and then proceed. We can do this in the moment. And the more that we begin to practice it, the more natural and, and sort of instinctual it becomes that we're, we're practicing this. Um, and then we also develop it over, over time. Uh, and can we, we can also reflect back on um, the, through at the end of the day, looking back on conversations or even, even more than that. And we'll talk about that here in, in, uh, in just a second. I want to offer some, some thoughts about how to evaluate success in these sorts of difficult conversations, right? Because the point is not just getting the other person to think the exact way that I do, right? There has to be more than just that. But we're talking about having this really deep, empathic engagement with another human being, then how do we measure that success? And the way I like to think about this is this idea of holding the frame. Um, if any of you are therapists, then probably you, you are familiar with this language, but um, a lot of therapists are, are trained with this notion of being able to hold the frame for a session, right? Meaning there, people are going to come into your office and, and say things that uh, you've never heard people say, or they're going to uh, present with things that you've never seen before. They're going to um, respond or behave in ways that are totally new to you. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, we never took a class on what to do when, to give an example of a friend of mine who's a therapist, my client shows up with a bottle of wine and sits on my couch and says, why don't we drink together during the session, right? In all of her years of graduate school, they never said, here's what to do in that situation. They didn't give her a textbook and say, here's how you respond. But she had been trained to know how to hold a frame for a session, meaning no matter what this person does, no matter how they respond, no matter what they bring into this moment, I'm going to hold the frame. And these things I know I will always do. These things I will always um, keep consistent I will um, uh, always start the session on time. I'll always end the session on time. I will never um, act in this particular way or I will never take over responsibility for my client or I will never act in ways that would, would harm them physically or emotionally. You know, those sorts of things that you'd say, this is, this is me holding the frame. So no matter what this person presents with or brings in, I know I can rely on this particular frame. I can control these things and I can point back and say, how did I do with holding that frame? So I want to give some examples of what it could look like for us to hold a frame in a difficult conversation with people. I was true to myself. I was honest about what I think, feel, and or need. My values were reflected in my actions. I did not raise my voice. I did not seek to become more. I did not seek to become less. This is one that I, I return to very often and, and have a sort of a spiritual practice of I'm frequently trying to, I look down and I'll even just see my feet on the ground and spend a few minutes just sort of grounding and centering myself, acknowledging I'm a human being and I do not need to seek to become more in this conversation, nor am I going to become less, right? I don't need to shrink back and allow this person to um, act in ways that are, are harmful to me, nor do I need to seek to become more and try to, to take the control or the power in this conversation, but that I am rooted and grounded here and I can be fully present who I am and stay in this place. That's a, a really important criterion for me. I did not subject myself to abusive or inhumane treatment 
nor did I inflict it. I practiced good listening. I was able to empathize with my conversation partner. I learned something new and my curiosity was piqued. I demonstrated honor and respect to myself and to my conversation partner. Look back at, at some of those, notice which, which of those, if any, felt really compelling to you and important for you. Think about which ones you might wanna add, that these would be a ways that you could then say, I'm gonna to commit to doing these things, and then I can reflect back on this conversation that I had and see how did I do? You know, How did I hold that frame? Um, how did I do in not raising my voice? How did I do in, in practicing um, empathy or, or good listening? These can be the things by which you evaluate the conversation and you'll find that when you, you are evaluating it in this, these ways, that the mirror is being held back on you, right? It's not being pointed to the person to say, well, did they move from A to B? Did they change their mind? Maybe they did. Maybe they're thinking or feeling differently about things. But ultimately, if the point is to increase our consciousness and our awareness about ourselves and how we are in the world, how we're reflecting our values in the ways that we're communicating, then this get, holds the mirror towards us to say, here's how I did or did not reflect those, those values. Here's how I did or um, did not hold the frame in that conversation, whether I was successful or not. Okay, so lastly, I want to offer this uh, reflective practice called examine. Uh, this is an ancient Christian practice, but certainly can be applicable to anybody of any faith or um, who doesn't identify with a particular faith. But if you're familiar, if you're familiar with um, uh, the uh, Jesuits, then um, this is a practice that is common for uh, Je Jesuits. And particularly because um, a gentleman named St. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded Je the Jesuit groups, he created this practice of examine. I have found it to be, for me, one of the most important disciplines that I can practice and engage. This idea of looking back and reflecting over your day and asking particular sets of questions. So I've modified it a little bit for our purposes here. But it's this idea of at the end of each day, just taking a few moments to recall the day's conversations, big or small small. So if you're in a season where you're wanting to increase um, your capacity and ability to engage in really good, rich conversations that, that can be difficult, then this might be something you say, I'm going to commit to at the end of each day, uh, just scanning back through and thinking about what were the, the conversations of the day. And as I do so, to just observe without judgment or critique, right? Just in my mind, observe how, how was I in those conversations? What, what, you know, what did I do? What did I say? How did I hold myself? Remember, empathy extends both ways. So we, um, when we offer empathy to other people, we are better able to do that when we're drawing from a deep well of the empathy with which we offer ourselves. So give yourself plenty of, of empathy, plenty of kindness in this, because we're going to get it wrong um, over and over and over, right? We need to offer kindness back to ourselves. Oh, yeah, I'm observing that I did this thing, right? Or I didn't hold the frame in that moment, okay? And as best as you're able to do it without judgment and critique, hold kindness for yourself. And then ask, when did my conversations most or least reflect my values? What was going on internally for me in the moments where I wasn't in line with my values, right? Like when this happened, when I, when I, I raised my voice or I spoke harshly to this person or I began to shift into um, some generalizations or dehumanizing language in talking to this person, what did I notice in that moment? Oh, I began, maybe I noticed that when they had all of these um, facts and these, these data and statistics and I felt stupid because I didn't feel like I had the same data to back up my position, I felt foolish and I felt embarrassed in that moment. And so what I did, I was triggered to then respond harshly to them. Okay, I noticed when I feel embarrassed, that's a trigger for me, a way that I might be more likely to shift away from my values into um, a way that I don't, I don't want to behave. So noticing what was going on internally for me in that moment, what was I feeling and being really honest with ourselves about that? Again, what moments did I feel triggered, caught off guard or rattled? These are really important things to pay attention to, particularly because we begin to notice patterns. We begin to notice every time someone says this or every time a person who looks this way or who I think identifies with this particular position or party or whatever, I notice this feeling within me and I say this or I think this or whatever it is. And we begin to see these patterns develop and that we can almost consistently begin to predict, oh yeah. So the pur purpose is, is the more that we notice those patterns and we ask ourselves these questions about what might I need to explore here, 
that we are increasing our consciousness so that not only at the end of the day we're reflecting on the conversations, but in the moment that we're engaging in these conversations, that we can be living consciously and say, oh, I noticed, there it is. Right now in this moment, like I feel, I feel foolish because this person seems smarter than me. And even though I don't agree with them, they seem to be able to articulate their position better than I can. I'm noticing that I feel foolish then and I have a choice. Which way do I want to go? What's the best way for me to, to reflect and demonstrate my values in this moment? And I'm beginning to make more conscious decisions rather than just reflexive and automatic that show that I'm really still a slave to my ego rather than living from this place of, of self-awareness. And then lastly, celebrate and commit. Celebrate the points where you say, man, I held that frame. I've been working so hard. What I think I would, you know, I, I was able to do that and hold that frame and, and um, evaluate myself uh, successful in that moment. Celebrate that. Absolutely. That's an incredible thing to celebrate. Um, we are much more likely to keep doing the th those things if we can name them and celebrate them and then commit. Do I need to, to commit to doing something differently or commit to keep doing the things this, the same way? Spend some time just making that, that commitment to yourself. Okay, as we wrap up our, our, our time together, I thought it might be helpful to, to do a really quick um, loving kindness meditation. So if it feels safe and comfortable for you, I'm gonna invite you to, uh, to close your eyes. And just begin breathing deeply in and out. Continuing to breathe. You have been breathing all day long, but this might be the first time all day that you've done so with any awareness around it. So take a minute and just breathe with awareness, being conscious of your breath. And if at any point during this brief meditation you find your mind wandering, just return to your breath and allow it to anchor you. As you continue to breathe, we're gonna offer a few words of loving kindness to four different parties. I'm gonna invite you to hold those, those parties in your mind as I recite the words of loving kindness to them. The first party is yourself. The second party is someone with whom you love to have conversation. The third party is someone with whom you have great difficulty in conversation. And the fourth party is the whole universe. Beginning with yourself, hear these words of loving kindness directed to you. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be safe from inner and outer dangers. May I be well in body and mind. May I be at ease and happy. Now hold in mind the individual with whom you love having conversation and see this loving kindness directed towards them. May they be filled with loving kindness. May they be safe from inner and outer dangers. May they be well in body and mind. May they be at ease and happy. Now bring to mind the person with whom you have great difficulty in conversation and see these loving kindness, this loving kindness directed towards them. May they be filled with loving kindness. May they be safe from inner and outer dangers. May they be well in body and mind. May they be at ease and happy. And lastly, 
bring all of creation into mind, creation that so desperately needs loving kindness in this moment, and see these words directed towards all. May all be filled with loving kindness. May all be safe from inner and outer dangers. May all be well in body and mind. May all be at ease and happy. Take another one or two deep breaths. When you're ready, just return your attention back to the screen. I find that to be a helpful meditation. One is it allows for empathy towards ourselves. It draws on the energy that we have when we engage with people whom we love and who we have really beautiful, fruitful, and wonderful conversations with. And it also takes some of that energy that we hold for ourselves, that we have with other people, and can extend it to those with whom maybe we have a little bit more difficulty in conversation. And maybe that inspires us to be able to continue to engage even when it's, when it's difficult. All right, before I get to any questions you all might have submitted, I just want to offer a few um, reminders about what we've got going on. So obviously, everything that we do is meant to bring people together, and we're in a season of social distancing where that's really difficult. So we're rethinking the way that we uh, operate here until um, things return to some new normal or whatever it may be. So in the meantime, I want to let you know we're having our seat at the table events, our flagship events, we're doing those virtually right now. We've had several and they've been really, really wonderful and lovely and given people some much needed space to be able to name and talk about what, what we're experiencing right now. Um, we also have our, our book club. We do those several times a year. And so the one this spring is gonna be uh, a virtual book club. And um, that is on Saturday, April 18th at 10 a.m. For both of these things, you can sign up at our website, faithandculturecenter.org. At the very top, you'll see a note about our COVID-19 response, and you'll see where you can um, sign up for both of these things. And then lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, let you know that, of course, we are always looking for folks who are willing to join with us and support the work that we do. All of our programs are free and open to the public. We long for these to be service in service to our community so that our communities can become more inclusive, they can be uh, more reflective of all of our values, and can be a space where everyone can flourish. And so we would be honored if uh, now or in the future, if you'd be willing to partner with us in any way to help support this work and uh, increase the things that we're seeking to do in the, in the community. Okay, so now I'm going to see if anybody um, submitted any questions. And certainly if you did not now, uh, but have some um, uh, happy to uh, respond by email or any other point. So I'm just gonna open the chat here and um, if, give, you, give a couple minutes if anybody wants to write in any questions there and I'll sit here for a few minutes and, re and respond. If you need to take a restroom break, you wanna run and do that, please feel free. Okay, don't see anything coming in right now. I'll sit here for another minute or so. Give you a chance to type something up if you're wondering. All right, friends. Well, in case I cut anybody off, who's trying to type something feverishly, uh, feel free just to send it to an email. Happy to, to engage. If there's something that um, I didn't explain clearly or that um, you just want to talk more about, I'm more than, than happy to do that. I hope that this has been helpful in some way. Uh, I hope for the chance to get to talk about and engage with some material further with, with each of you at some of our upcoming programs. Thanks for joining us tonight. Please take care of yourselves. Be well, and we wish you the best. Bye.